Good day, everyone. We hope that all is well with you guys. I am here to introduce you to Unit 2, Modules 1 and 3, together with my group mates. So, hi, I am Fatima. I am Angel. I am Sayul. We are Group 3 and we will be discussing the analysis of statements and the types of knowledge things. Pero, bago tayo tuloy ang magtungo sa pagdidiscuss ng Modules 1 and 3 ng Unit 2, bakit nga ba muna mahalagang pag-aralan natin ang unit na ito? So, ang aim ng Unit 2 ng book ni Andre Sito, I Acuna, is to provide us with a very solid foundation in identifying the different types of knowledge claims by tracing their epistemological roots from the three central issues of epistemology. So, sa pamamagitan ng unit na ito ay magkakaroon tayo ng kakayahang tukuyin ang mga knowledge claims na magagamit natin sa pag-analyze ng katotohanan. Makatutulong ang unit na ito sa atin sa pag-distinguish ng realm of the known knowable, unknowable, provable, and unprovable. So wala nang patumpik-tumpik pa. Halina, tumpisahan natin talakayin ang una at pangatlong module na nakaata sa amin para sa unit na ito. Angel, the stage is yours now. So, let's start with module 1, Analysis of Statements. This module will begin with what you're familiar with, types of sentences. Then, it will focus on the nature of statements including the basic principles for analyzing statements. It will end with an elaboration of the three principles of logic governing the truth values of statements. Let's hit it off with the first topic. Types of sentences are grammatically classified into five main types. First is the interrogative sentence. An interrogative sentence is a sentence that asks a question. Example, what time is it? The next one is the imperative sentence. This type of sentence gives command, demand, or an instruction. For example, shut the door. The third type of sentence is what we call the exclamatory sentence. It makes a statement that conveys strong emotion or excitement. What a game is an example of this. Another one is what we call expletive sentences. This is used when we are expressing a desire or a wish. An example of an expletive sentence is, I hope my business succeeds. The last one is what we call a declarative sentence. A declarative sentence is a sentence that makes a statement, provides a fact, offers an explanation, or conveys information. Example, the sun rises from the east. Let's now focus our attention on one very important use of language, namely, using a sentence to assert a knowledge claim. Interrogative, imperative, exclamatory, and expletive are merely uttered. These type of sentences have no truth value, and even if the command is not obeyed, the command is not falsified. For example, when we say, what a game, there is no basis whether a statement is true or false because there was no knowledge claim. On the other hand, declarative sentences have a different case. This time, we are asserting something that can either be true or false. In this case, we have used a declarative sentence to assert a knowledge claim. Now, let's talk about sentences and statements. Let me tell you the meaning of these two first. Sentence is a group of words usually containing a subject and a verb. Expressing a statement, question, instruction, or exclamation. And when written, starting with the capital letter and ending with the period or other mark. Meanwhile, a statement is made up of concepts which express basic facts or opinion. Concepts can be expressed by different words in the same language or it could be expressed in a different language as well. Similarly, we can have many sentences not necessarily in the same language expressing the same knowledge claim. The use of declarative sentences to assert a knowledge claim marks an important distinction in philosophy. Most philosophers accept that a sentence is not the bearer of truth or falsehood, but it is the statement it expresses. Some philosophers as well as logicians prefer to use the term proportion rather than statement, but they agree that the truth and falsehood are properties of statements expressed by sentences on certain occasions to make a knowledge claim about what is or is not the case. When we use a sentence to make a knowledge claim by asserting or denying, this situation leads to the making of a statement. Many philosophers accept that sentences cannot be both true and false because a single sentence often contains two or more statements or knowledge claims. How do we analyze the truth value of statements? Let me give you an example of a declarative statement. A cat is on the mat. 
you will only succeed in expressing a statement provided that in the world there is a mat and there is a cat, and the state of affairs that the cat is on the mat actually exists. If so, then you have succeeded in using a sentence to assert a knowledge claim that you have verified to be true. However, if there is a mat and there is a cat, but the state of affairs that the cat is on the mat does not exist, then you have succeeded in verifying a knowledge claim that is false. But, if there are no mat and there is no cat, you have not even succeeded in expressing a knowledge claim at all. This means that you have failed to use a declarative sentence to assert a knowledge claim. This time, we are going to talk about the three principles governing the analysis of the truth value of statements or what Aristotle called the three laws of thought. The first one is the principle of identity, which states that if a statement is true, then it is true, and if a statement is false, then it is false. This means that the truth value of a statement is stable over time. In formulation, the principle that where x is known to be identical to y in any statement about x will have the same meaning and truth value as the same statement about y, meaning x is equal to y. The second principle is the principle of non-contradiction. This guarantees that a statement cannot both be true and false at the same time and in the same respect. It is often confused with the concept of inconsistency. In logic, the law of non-contradiction states that contradictory propositions cannot both be true in the same sense at the same time. One of the given examples is when you assert a knowledge claim that the blackboard is green, the contradictory knowledge claim is the blackboard is not green. If two statements are contradictory, it follows that if the affirmative is true, then the denial is always false. So if the blackboard is green is true, then the denial that the blackboard is not green must always be false, whatever else is the color of the blackboard. In formulation, x does not have the same meaning and truth value as negative y, meaning x is not equal to negative y. In contrast, statements that are only inconsistent can both be true and false at the same time. When two statements are inconsistent, this means both statements can be false but both cannot be true at the same time. The last principle is what we call the principle of excluded middle. The principle of non-contradiction prepares the way for the acceptance of the third principle. The principle states that a statement can only have two truth values. Either it is true or it is false and nothing else. According to Russell, the law of excluded middle means that everything must either be or not be. The law is being used in set here in other branches of mathematics. In formulation, x must be equal to y or x must be equal to negative y. There is no middle ground. So ayon, after learning the different ways to utilize words and the use of a variety of sentence and statement forms based on the different types of language games, let us now proceed to the epistemological classification of knowledge claims because we will be needing these classifications to learn complicated and sophisticated skills in argument composition. So about five decades ago, sinasabi na maraming philosophers ang nagtalo o nagdebate kung ilang klase ng knowledge claim nga ba ang talagang mayroon. Now, let us discover and discuss the valuable lessons from the roots of the said controversy. So unahin na natin ang tinatawag na logical facetivism. Noong taong 1930s, pinangunahan ng isang logical facetivist na nagangalang Morris Click ang pagdevelop ng theory of knowledge, which is patterned after the epistemology of David Hume noong 1700s. This was the basic epistemological framework that Hume offered, which the logical accept, uh, positivist accepted and developed into a full-blown theory of knowledge. So according to logical facetivism, there are only two sources of knowledge namely reason and sense perception or logical reasoning and empirical experience. Given that there are only two sources of knowledge, it is said that there can only be two types of knowledge. So, rito na pumapasok ang tinatawag na formal knowledge at empirical knowledge. So, ang formal knowledge is from the faculty of reason and its example include mathematics, logic, algebra, and geometry. In the language of Hume, this type of knowledge is intuitively and demonstratively certain. So, sa madaling salita, sinasabi na ang formal knowledge ay nagpapakita ng katiyakan. 
On the other hand, empirical knowledge is from the perception of our five senses at ang mga halimbawa ay nanggaling sa natural and social sciences like physics, biology, sociology, psychology, at marami pang iba. So, logical facetivists say that knowledge claims can only be formal or empirical, meaning para sa kanila ay ito lamang dalawang ito at wala nang iba pa. So, ngayon naman ay talakayin natin ng mas malalim ang two sources of knowledge. So, in this part, we will see how connected the ideas are. So, from the two sources of knowledge, which are the faculty of reason and the faculty of sense perception, we have formal knowledge claim and empirical knowledge claim. Now, these two knowledge claims naman led to the only two epistemological types of meaningful statements known as analytic statements and empirical statements. So, empirical knowledge claim and empirical statement are used almost synonymously same as the formal knowledge claim and analytic statement. From that, we can say that ideas are indeed connected. So, ayan, talakayin naman natin yung dalawang bagong terminologies na tinatawag na epistemological types of meaningful statements. Unahin na natin ang analytic statement. So, para daw makabuo ka ng isang formal knowledge claim, ay kailangan mo munang mag-formulate ng isang analytic statement. Ang halimbawa rito ay yung binigay ni Hume na the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the square of the two sides. Ito ay nabuo sa pamamagitan ng analytic statement. So, kung maaalala nyo, yung halimbawang ito ay formula ng isang right angle triangle sa Pythagoras. At kung babalikan natin ang mga naonang na-discuss ko, ang mathematics sa isang halimbawa ng formal knowledge na ginagamit sa pagbuo ng isang analytic statement. On the other hand, if an empirical knowledge is made like the sun will rise tomorrow. So, the claim is made using empirical statement dahil gumamit ka ng observation and five senses. So, in layman's term, mula sa faculty of sense perception, makakabuo ka ng isang um, empirical statement. At mula naman doon ay makapag-formulate ka ng isang empirical knowledge. Sa kabilang banda, mula naman sa faculty of reason, makakabuo ka ng isang analytic statement na magiging formal knowledge claim kalaunan. So, after discussing about the two sources of knowledge, ngayon naman ay dumako tayo sa two theories of truth. Sinasabi na Hume's distinction between ideas and facts led directly to the separation of two different theories of truth, which are the correspondent theory of truth and the coherence theory of truth. So, this part is merely just about verifying the truths. And correspondence theory of truth is used in verifying an empirical claim with the use of five senses, while on the other hand, coherence theory of truth naman is used in verifying a formal claim with the use of the faculty of reason. So, hindi ko na masyadong um, tatalakayin yung part na to kasi this will be discussed further in module 4, the theories of truth. Ngayon naman ay dumako tayo sa pagpapaliwanag kung ano nga ba ang empirical claims. Empirical claims are said to be the easiest to recognize, identify, and author. Ang simpleng paglalarawan mo sa iyong sarili, katabi sa ibang tao, at maski sa iyong kapeligiran ay tinatawag ng isang empirical knowledge claim. Ngunit kahit ganito ito kasimple, kailangan mong siguraduhin na ang bawat sinasabi mong empirical claim ay nag exist sa mundong ating kinagalawan. Narito ang ilang halimbawa. I am very attentive today. The girl beside me is wearing a red dress. My classmates are noisy. Palma Hall Room 312 has a busted electric fan. The, we the weather is warm. So ngayon, ano ang napansin nyo sa mga halimbawang ito? Um, as we can see from the given examples, ay matutukoy natin ito with the use of one or combinations of our five senses. So, rito, gumagamit rin tayo ng correspondence theory dahil gumagamit tayo ng five senses. And correspondence theory is used in verifying an empir empirical claim. And with all these being said, gamit ang five senses natin sa pag oobserba ng mga bagay-bagay ay matutukoy natin kung totoo nga ba o mali ang mga empirical claims na mababasa natin base sa isang konteksto ng kinabibilangan natin. In contrast to the empirical claims, now we have here the analytic claims. Analytic claims is where the type of knowledge claims is called formal or analytic. And the statement used to make that claim is of course called analytic statement. Ang analytic claims naman ay mga statement kung saan ang claims ay about sa gamit o kahulugan ng isang term. Halimbawa, 
puppies are young dogs. This analytic statement can appear as empirical kasi pwedeng sabihin na nagde-describe ng animal. But no, this is, this is an analytic statement for it is a claim about the use of or the meaning of the term puppies. In this part, another philosopher entered the discussion and that is Immanuel Kant. And he defined analytic judgment naman as one where the predicate is contained in the subject. Narito ang ilang mga halimbawa upang mas malinawan tayo. Bachelors are unmarried males. Fathers are male parents. Bigamy is uh, getting married twice. Brothers are male siblings. Makikita natin sa mga halimbawang ito ay tila mas binigyan lamang ng mas malalim na kahulugan ng predicate iyong ating mga subject. Gamit ang mga halimbawang ito na si Kant mismo ang nagbigay, mas may hinuha natin ang nais niyang iparating. Sa unang example, ang predicate na unmarried males bilang isang konsepto ay nakapaloob sa ating subject na bachelors. The same as the succeeding examples. So, ang mga subject at konsepto na bachelors, fathers, bigamy, at brothers ay binigyan definition lamang. Um, these subjects are for formally defined in English language and that is what Kant wants us to grasp. So, analytic statements are a priori and their truth is based on the rules of the language. It is the reason and contains relations of ideas. Denying it would imply a contradiction. So now, here is Cyril to continue this discussion. How do we verify if an analytic statement is true? Dito naman papasok si Clarence Theory. So to give you guys a little bit of background, as stated by James Young of Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, a coherence theory of truth states that the truth of any true proposition consists in its coherence with some specified set of propositions. This indicates that kailangan natin determine kung marami bang language games ang nakapalab sa konsepto ng bachelor, father, at brother na ginamit sa parang formal na kahulugan in the English language. These examples are coherence with the use of linguistic system. Dahil kung ating titignan, ginamit ang word na bachelor sa kanyang formal na kahulugan sa English na tumutukoy sa mga unmarried males. Therefore, this sort of analytic statement would be true only when determined by the usage of coherence theory. On the other hand naman, David Hume calls such definition as intuitively or demonstratively, meaning the denial of these analytic statements would lead to a contradiction or absurdity. And if the denial doesn't result in either a contradiction or absurdity, then the statement is not analytic. Ang halimbawa ng isang denial of analytic statement ay ito. All bachelors are not unmarried males. Diba, if we would analyze the statement, you will agree to na the denial is, is absurd. Nampaka-illogical nga naman kung ating isipin dahil bachelor sa nga tapos not unmarried males pa. If you are still confused whether a statement is analytic or empirical, you can deny or negate the sentence to verify it. If negation is reasonable or plausible, like the example, bachelors cannot be happy or unhappy, then the statement is empirical. If mapapansin nyo, ang predicate na happy or unhappy ay hindi nakapalab sa intention of the concept ng bachelor. So, kahit i-deny man natin ang empirical statement na ito, ay hindi siya magiging resulta ng contradiction. But, if the denial is contradictory or worse, absurd, just like the statement, a bachelor cannot be married, then the statement is analytic. Let's move to another concept, the paradigm. Ang paradigm naman sa isang analytic statement ay nangagaling sa mga formal systems, particularly mathematics and logic. Basically, for mathematics, the laws or theorems of algebra and geometry are part of the class of anal analytic statement Dahil technically, sila ay kilala bilang well-formed formula or WFF for short. Ang isang magandang halimbawa nito ay 5 plus 7 is equals to 12. If we analyze the statement, we would notice that it is an example of an arithmetic equation. So the truth relies on its coherence with the arithmetical system. Another example pa is that uh, the sum of angles of a quadrilateral is equal to 360 degrees. If we were to observe, this statement illustrates the angle sum property of a quadrilateral under geometry. Aside naman sa mathematics, Logics could also be used as a paradigm of analytical statements. But, I would not discuss it further dahil kasama siya sa Unit 3. Pero bibigyan ko kayo ng isang classic example of analytic statement. To be or not to be. This is a tautological statement in symbolic logic. Meaning, your statement is always true because it is tautology. How many meaningful statements are there? Before, there was an argument over the quantity and types of meaningful statements. Paano nga ba nagsimula ito? It all arose when logical positivists insolently declared that only two categories of meaningful statements agree to two types of knowledge claims. In short, it would only be either analytical or empirical. 
Kung ang statement mo man ay empirical, there must be a method to check the statement. And the process of verification itself would be the way to determine the meaning of the statement. So kung hindi mo man ma-verify ang statement mo at wala rin method para ma-check pa ito, ang ibig sabihin lamang ito ay walang meaning ang statement mo. Therefore, the statement has no cognitive or in other words, the statement has no truth value. So dahil nga sabi ng mga logical positivist na mayroon ng dalawang klase ng meaningful statements na tumutugon sa analytical at empirical knowledge claims, pwede parang sinasabi na rin nila ng mga moral, legal, ethical, religious, political, at aesthetic statements are meaningless dahil sila ay evaluative rather than analytical or empirical. And this division elicited a strong reaction from many philosophers of various persuasion. Ayan, bilang nabanggit ko na rin ang evaluative statements as meaningless kanina, ngayon naman ay pagtutuunan natin ng pansin ito. An evaluative claim is a review about the value, this value, the positive or negative worth of an action, behavior, thing or situation. So kung ikaw man tinitignan mo ang isang bagay bilang moral or immoral, you are already executing an evaluative claim. According naman kay David Hume, ang mga judgment na ito ay nanggagaling sa mga passions at emotions. Genuine impressions give an appearance to genuine ideas as a result of these passions and emotions. Kaya naman para sa kanya, ang mga judgment made from passions and emotions would never be meaningless. Ngayon naman ay magtungo tayo sa mga different types of evaluative claims. Ang ilan sa mga ito ay mga moral, legal, ethical, religious, political, and aesthetic statements. Ang pinaka-common naman sa mga statements na ito ay ang moral statements such as sex without love is immoral, religious statements such as polygamy is a mortal sin, and aesthetic statements such as the sunset is beautiful. There is also a case for the declarative form of the evaluative statement na it could be either true or false na similar siya sa analytical or empirical statements. Obligatory form of the evaluative statement naman occurs when you affirm what activities are forbidden or mandatory. Halimbawa, you should practice what you preach or sex education should be taught in school. These are commands in a positive form which is named prescriptive. But if an order is negative such as don't cheat in the exam or don't forget to pay your bills, then it is called prescriptive. To summarize it, if you are still confused about what career of truth you want to apply, you must first know kung anong type of knowledge claim you wish to verify. Kung ang claim mo naman is formal or analytical, then you can use coherence. But if the claim is empirical, you can use correspondence theory of truth. And if the claim is evaluative, then the justification is based on the public's consent or intersubjective consensus. That's all for modules 1 and 3. If you guys still have questions in mind, please let us know. Thank you for listening. Bye!